Hi, I'm Matt, and this is the Ohm Audio Channel. So let's say you're looking for a bookshelf speaker, you just got yourself started into some music listening, or maybe you have an entry-level home theater, and you're looking for a small bookshelf speaker that's not going to break the bank. Let's say your budget is $120 at the max. Well, the Naomi BS5 bookshelf speaker might be something you may want to consider. With Naomi being relatively new here in the U.S., it's not necessarily a household name, say, as like Klipsch, JBL, Polk Audio, and so forth. It's something that you're not going to see on the shelves at your local electronic store or big box stores. Um, but at $100, the Naomi BS5 represents a fantastic value uh, for the performance level that you get, which is really what we're all about here at the Ohm Audio channel. Products that provide meaningful performance at their given price points. You're not paying extra for something just because of a brand name or just because of an extra feature that may not necessarily um, relate to anything that, that adds to the enjoyment of the product. So let's sit back, let's talk, take a look at the BS5 and see what makes this thing tick. As I said in the intro, Naomi's a brand you may not immediately recognize as something like Klipsch, Polk Audio, JBL. You're not going to find it in any store at any shelf anywhere. They sell exclusively through Amazon and only started doing that, mm, I think, late 2019 with the BS5 bookshelf speaker as their first product. Now, just because you don't recognize the name doesn't mean it's a bad product. In fact, I think it's a very good product. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at this thing and, and see what makes it tick. So. Naomi BS5. Of course, one of the first things I really enjoyed about this product was the grills. I know it's not necessarily something we get super excited about, but at $100 include magnetic grills that hold on this well is fantastic value. I mean, at this point in time, it's 2021 now, there is no excuse for manufacturers to be including the stupid little peg style um, retention pins for their grills. It Magnetic grills, it really, that... It, to me, that's almost a must-have feature at this point, especially ones that are this good. I mean, you're, that's that's not coming off very easily, guys. So if you're someone that has to run with the grills on because maybe you have some small fingers that like to poke at things or you just don't like the aesthetics of the spare speaker drivers, that's okay. Um, the grills hold on exceptionally well. You're not going to have them vibrating around even when playing hard. Okay, so as the name BS5 would indicate, this bookshelf speaker does include a 5-inch fiberglass woofer, um, a 1-inch silk dome tweeter, and then uh, dual ports on the front, which do have a small bevel in them. I don't necessarily think that's for controlling any kind of port resonance, but it does add a nice uh, little bit of aesthetic and, um, you know, just a, a nicer look to the speaker. Um, speaking in looks, one thing I really do like about the speaker is actually the vinyl wrap. Um, now, most speakers at this price point are going to use this very flat, very boring looking vinyl wrap around the entire speaker. So it looks very monochromatic. It doesn't look very interesting. It just looks like a cheap speaker. Um, Naomi Tech decided to go with this uh, vinyl wrap that has a little bit of a highlights in the wood grain. So even though it is a fake wood grain, um, the silver highlights and just adds a little bit of uh, contrast to it, which I think speaks well to this speaker just you know looking a little bit nicer than what a hundred dollars would indicate um, on the back of the speaker we do have just your standard five-way binding posts on the plastic little cup um, the label does have a serial number which i do like um, so if in case they ever have an issue with any of their suppliers perhaps maybe they had an issue with some of the parts on the crossover maybe one of their driver suppliers had a whoopsie and they need a recall or send out a notification or if you have any issues they can trace it down to a particular manufacturing date now me personally i have not had any issues with these speakers um, i will say however one of the domes on the tweeters was pressed in out of the box um, fortunately that's a very easy fix that you can do yourself just take a a paper towel tube or a toilet paper roll tube place it over the top of the tweeter and just inhale deeply and it should pop it right out kind of the same trick if you have a, a dented dome on the woofer, you just take a piece of tape and just pull it out and it should pop out. <clears throat> now, um, as far as listening, the, the equipment I used was primarily three different pieces of equipment. So the first one would have been my 
Yamaha TSR 700 AVR. Um, that probably did about 80% of my listening tests over here in my basement, which is an unfinished open basement. Very large space, so it's difficult to judge bass performance just because of the size of the space that we're sitting in. Um, the other device I used was an FX Audio uh, 502, which is a small Class D Bluetooth amplifier. Uh, I believe that's rated at 30 watts per channel. And then also I use my big boy GFA, uh, excuse me, Adcom GFA 5500, which is rated at 200 watts per channel. And that's a big old monster class AB amplifier from the 90s. And that thing is an absolute powerhouse. And you certainly don't need that much power to drive this. The speaker is rated at six ohms and has a sensitivity rating of 86 decibels. Uh, so you don't really need a tremendous amount of power to bring this to satisfying level and honestly I wouldn't send this a lot of power uh, because you do get into distortion levels pretty early on after you get to that 86 to 90 decibels in room so when they're measuring those sensitivity levels of course the microphone's only sitting you know one meter away or just a touch over three feet and most people don't listen that close to you. although you could with these speakers i i did use them here on my desktop and they do work really well for that application um, but if you're listening in say like a small to medium size bedroom living room a small home theater these are going to be plenty loud for you without getting too distorted or too shouty but if you're trying to fill in a large space, maybe inside of a garage or something, I, you might want to look at something else because these things do get into distortion pretty early on, um, even in the mid-range and, and treble area. So if, if you're trying to fill a large space, you might want to look at something else. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the aspects of when I was listening to what the things I liked and what things I didn't like. Some things that were good, some things that weren't so great. Uh, to be honest, there were nothing about these speakers when listening to it. I thought, gosh, that's that's just no good. Um, these things do a lot of things right. So one of the speakers, this kind of reminds me of, of the old Pioneer BS-22s that Andrew Jones designed probably about, what, 10, 15 years ago. Um, those had just, you know, just a very pleasant, easy listening type of a sound and just never did anything wrong. You're kind of getting the same thing here. These things are not a an exciting speaker kind of like something like a, a clips or maybe even um, cube acoustics would typically are they have a little bit more of a bumped up treble uh, upper treble uh, maybe upper mid-range uh, and just are very exciting and engaging these aren't that these actually lean a little bit more towards the neutral side and we'll take a look at that and when we look at the the measurements on here is that these speakers at a hundred dollars measure really well uh, in fact they measure better for some speakers they're you know if you were to add an extra zero to the price, it still don't measure as well as these are. Um, now, there are some areas where the $100 does show, and that's, of course, in the cabinet. It is a little bit resonant, but, you know, you can't expect the world for 100 bucks. So you kind of kind of keep your expectations in check. But, but, um, it's still a fantastic speaker to listen to. So let's talk about the bass performance. Bass on this thing is good. For the size, I think it's absolutely adequate. You will need a subwoofer um, in most cases. Now, there are some times where I would be listening to the speaker and I think, oh man, where's the bass? And other times I think, oh wow, where'd that bass come from? And um, so Naomi rates this down to 50 hertz in room. So anechoically, I don't know what that would re rating would be. I suspect it's somewhere around maybe the upper 50s for its anechoic uh, measurement, meaning if it's in a, in a completely echo-free or outdoor type in an environment. My measurements, I wasn't able to go that low just because of how I was measuring it. Um, but I will say that the base on here, as far as the extension, is okay. So one of the songs I like to use when evaluating bass extension is uh, by Dead Mouse, and the song is Strobe. Um, most of, some of you might be familiar with that song. Uh, about midway through the song, there is a section where the the beat drops out. It kind of cycles through this phrase of a, where it's just adding layer upon layer upon layer of bass, starting from mid bass all the way down into somewhere into the 40 hertz range. Um, the last couple cycles through, or when you get into the really low notes and while the speaker is playing it, it's not, it's, it's, you get a sense that the note is there, but it is not at the same level as the rest of the music. So there is, 
the roll off is okay. Um, so there, you if you're listening to a lot of EDM rap, bass heavy music, you're gonna want a subwoofer, and you're probably gonna want to cross this over so that way you're not working this woofer so hard and causing um, any extra dis distortion than what you need. <clears throat> As far as texture and tonality of the bass, I found this to be quite good. And I think that's a characteristic of fiber woofers like this fiberglass fiber. Um, similarly to paper cone woofers, generally when you have a, a paper cone woofer, you're going to give up maybe a little bit ultimate extension like you get with an aluminum cone. Um, but you make up for that in just the, the texture and the tonality of the bass. When that comes into play is when you're listening to music that has a lot of like say upright bass, maybe jazz bass guitars, toms on a on a, on a drum set, you know, big or orchestral instruments, low brass, you know, your trombones, your tubas, and so forth. Um, this does a really good job of that. Um, one of my favorite tracks to evaluate texture and tone is by Alive in the Wilderness, and the song is called Wolfhead. And in that song, the bassist is just absolutely attacking the strings, just the lowest strings on that bass and just going at it. And you pick up on the string as it's drawn, or excuse me, the bow as it's drawn across the string and you can just hear that that attack of that bow on the string. But also you get a sense of the, the fullness and the body of that bass, of that upright bass as you just sit in there just just absolutely going to talent on this thing and it's very satisfying to listen to it's a very emotional song if you haven't heard it before i would suggest looking it up it is uh it's it's a really neat track but the the bass on that is fantastic uh and i just i think this did a, a, an excellent job of that it um it never fell apart in in that in that song <clears throat> Now, if we move on to the mid-range, you know, upper bass, lower mid-range region, again, this speaker does a very good job. Um, so things like, you know, acoustic guitars, male vocals come through very nicely they, with very full bodiness to them. Um, I think it's a little bit bumped up, and, and we'll take a look at the measurements, and there is just a little bit of a, an elevated mid-bass region on this speaker, um, which lends itself to being a little bit warmer sounding. Um, a little bit nicer to listen to for when you're listening to stuff with a lot of acoustic guitar. Um, it does a very good job of picking up the, the resonance of the body in the guitar. And also any male singers, you know, things like Michael Bublé, Johnny Cash, any low uh, registers, you know, your bass, your power tones are going to sound really good for these speakers. Tenors sound okay. Sorry guys, I had to put it in a cough drop. My kids sneezed in my eyeballs and gave me a cold. Alright, so once you get past, say, your male vocals and the bar bass baritone range, move into your tenors and then move into your altos and soprano singers. Um, again, these speakers are still going to do a really good job, uh, particularly singers like Adele, Sarah Borelli, Noah Wall are one, some of my favorites to listen to. Um, sound fantastic, very rich, very full sounding um, in, the, in the vocals. Um, now, once you get into more, you know, the high, into sopranos, say like opera sopranos, they're not going to be as as present as they will be, and say, you know, um, an alto soprano or uh, excuse me, an alto singer will be, um, just because there is a little bit of a recessed sec section in the response, which we will take a look at. Um, drums. So I'm a, you know, drummer by heart. I play drums for a brief moment. Um, Snare drums. Now, snare drums kind of happen around that 2K region, 1 to 2K region. And because this is just ever so slightly recessed in that, snare drums don't quite have that attack that I like to hear in songs. Um, that's something I'm always listening for when I'm listening to music is just how that snare drum sounds. Because it's just, I, when I, whenever I play a snare drum, I just want to hear and feel that attack of that snare drum. Now, you do get the body of the snare drum from the speaker, uh, but that the initial attack from the stick... Is not really is not really there. It's just pulled back just ever so slightly. Um, <clears throat> so it's still very pleasing to listen to when you're listening to jazz jazz music and you have a, a drummer just going into a really nice solo and he, um, still very nice, still presents well. It's just that you don't have that initial tack. All right. <clears throat> now once you move past mid range and move into upper mid range and into the treble region, this is where the speaker probably has its weakest points. Um, so if you're a rocker, like to listen to a lot of rock music, especially heavily distorted, real crunchy guitar, ACDC, Audio Slave, Lamb of God, anything of that type of a genre, 
these speakers may not be your cup of tea. Um, the thing I found, especially with like Audio Slave, is that you know the uh, Tom Morello's guitar has supposed to have just a lot of a crunch to it and just really aggressive sounded, but it came through a bit soft on this speaker. It was still there, but it just wasn't as you know exciting as and engaging as I would expect it to be for that type of music. Now moving past upper upper mid range and into treble, we're talking things like cymbals and so forth. Cymbals uh, sound pretty good on these, a little bit soft, um, but not bad. And I think the little bit softer treble also does well for poorly recorded albums or if you listen to a lot of uh, compressed music. If you're primarily listening to, you know, Spotify or Pandora where you're listening to very lossy compressed music, this will take some of the edge out of that. Um, a good example of that is Johnny Cash's Hurt. Now, when he gets into the last couple of verses of the song, he's just absolutely attacking that microphone, and it is clipping hard. I mean, just absolutely hard. I don't know how that album got released as it is, but on these speakers, even when I had them playing at a reasonably loud volume, around 80 decibels or so, the distortion was there, the clipping was there from uh, Johnny's, uh, from the way it was mixed, but it wasn't overly aggressive to where I'm like, ah, God, I got to turn that down. It's more of a, ooh, man, that's that's pretty rough, guys. You, you, you screwed that one up. Um, other speakers that have a little bit more of a pronounced top end, you're going to be reaching for that volume knob and turning it down. I didn't feel I had to do that with this speaker. We're going to talk about soundstage and imaging. These things have a fantastic soundstage and image, which absolutely blew me away for this type of a price point. <clears throat> what I what I mean by soundstage and imaging. So imaging is placement of in the instruments in the recording. One of my favorite songs to check that out is Death Has No Mercy by Noah Wall off the album Hometown Blues. Um, that album was recorded in a Brooklyn church with a binaural dummy microphone. So it's just a head with two little dummy ear microphones. And the band would surround the microphones and play. And it's just a very simple, I believe, four or five piece band and singer. Now, she's sitting front and center uh, in front of the microphone, which you can definitely hear. Um, what's unique about that particular track is that the way they record it and when she sings like these big crescendos, you can hear the echo in the space of the, of the church on the inside. And it's a very um, pleasant experience, almost ethereal, if you will. And then also, as she's moving around, getting emotional in the song, and she kind of sways her body, you can pick up on that in the recording. You can actually hear her panning a little bit left and right as she's singing. And it's the same with the instruments. So you have like the guitars that are flanking you left and right. And again, you can hear their movements a little bit as they're playing and getting into the music. And it's really nice that this speaker was able to pick up on those very subtle placements of the instruments. Another song I like to use is Tool's Chocolate Chip Trip. Um, throughout that song, there is a synthesizer effect that is just panning left or right. And on a good set of speakers that image well, such as these, um, that that synthesizer will extend outside the boundaries of the speakers. And they did by three or four feet on this thing. Um, when I was sitting in uh, my living room, uh, it sounded like it was coming from outside my, my wall from the living room because it just it kept going on that direction. It was fantastic. Um, and again... In that song, um, the, 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 as the drums are playing and he's playing the tom drums and they come down, you could hear the, the placement of the toms, not only horizontally, but also vertically. You can it, to get a sense of how the toms are placed and recorded. So they, they pan from top left all the way down to bottom right, which is a really nice effect for a speaker that's only $100. And another thing I liked about the speaker was the scale of the sound. So when you have some speakers that soundstage and image quite largely, sometimes they can make the instruments of the singer sound bigger than they what they really are. Uh, a really good example, of course, um, totally different type of speaker are magna pans. Magna pans make everything sound monstrous. Like when you're listening to singers, it sounds like their mouth is the size of a football. Um, it's a really neat effect, but I don't find it's very true to life. What I found at these speakers is that everything felt very true to life as far as its scale. So singers sounded appropriately sized. Guitars didn't sound overly large or overly small. They sounded just right. Um, now with singers too, is that if the recording had it, um, the vocals will actually come above the speakers. Uh, Johnny Cash's Hurt, um, Adele, all those 
albums that uh, I was listening to that had good recording on the vocalist, you know, the, the, the vocalist sounded one to two feet above the speaker, which was, you know, very appropriate, like they were standing in the room, because, you know, if you're in a sitting position, have these at the same height as your listening height, you know, 30, 36 inches off the ground, then that vocalist's voice is coming about five feet or so off the ground, which is where you expect it to be. All right, now that I've talked your ear off about how I think these things sound, let's take a look at some of the measurements and see how these actually measured up. Um, so the first chart we're going to be looking at is the on-access response with the grills on and off. Um, take a look, the black line is with the grills off, red line with the grills on. Nothing too scary here. Of course, you do lose a little bit of output between 3 kilohertz and 6 kilohertz with the grill on, so if you can, play with the grills off. Okay. Uh, next thing we'll take a look at is the horizontal off axis. So this is taking the speaker with the microphone sitting at the tweeter level uh, straight in front and then rotating the speaker 10 degree increments at a time. Now our measurements for that are black, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. Um, you can see the legend there if you need to take a look at long, go ahead and pause the screen. But just if it is here, the speaker measured just fine in the horizontal plane. There is nothing here that's really scary, just a nice gentle roll, roll off of the top end, which is what you would totally find, uh, expect to find in a speaker that is well designed. Okay, so the next thing we'll take a look at is the vertical response, starting again at the microphone at the tweeter level and then going above the tweeter at 10 degree increments again. Starting the black line is our base measurement and then red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. Um, nothing here is really outstandingly bad. There is a little bit of a dipped region in the crossover, which is something you would expect to see. Um, even well-designed speakers will have some kind of a dipped out region, except for maybe say something with like a concentric driver would be measuring really well through here. Um, one thing that's interesting about this, if we take out some of the extra measurements and leave in just the baseline, and then 20 and 30 degree measurements, those actually were the worst measurements as far as how they uh, dipped out in the crossover region. Okay, going back to now we're looking at the vertical response above the speaker, again, starting at the tweeter level and then going up at 10 degree increments. Uh, again, the same color scheme, black for the baseline, red, orange, yellow, green, blue. Um, and again, about the only measurement here that looks really kind of nasty is the 30 degree measurement. So for whatever reason, this speaker, when you're either 30 degrees above it or below it, it just doesn't sync up very well as far as the integration between the two drivers due to the crossover. Last measurement we'll take a look at, of course, is the impedance sweep. Um, take a look on the woofer side. We are just under six ohms and on the tweeters we are just over four ohms so everything checks out there for the claimed nominal impedance of six ohms so i don't think you'll have any issues driving this with any kind of vintage equipment any off-the-shelf avr maybe even smaller uh and less expensive class d amplifiers again i don't because of the, the impedance of this don't think you have too many issues uh running that speaker all right so what are my final thoughts on this speaker who is this speaker for I think the speaker is for that guy or gal who's just getting into maybe some two-channel audio listening. Maybe they've inherited a turntable from their parents or from an aunt and uncle or something. Have a small vinyl collection or just starting to build a small vinyl collection and just want to be able to listen to that. This is great for that and this will take you a long way. For the money, I think this is an, a fantastic way to get into the hobby of listening to music. For you guys that are looking into home theater, again, I think this is a really good value uh, proposition. It's not gonna be the most exciting speaker to listen to for home theater, but also at the same time, it's not gonna be the most fatiguing speaker to listen to. The problem with some uh, other brands out there that have a little bit more of a tipped up top end yeah, they sound more exciting and engaging, but after a while, you're like, mm, man, I got to turn that down a bit. That's getting a little bit much. And that is my review of the Naomi BS5 bookshelf speaker. If you like the video, please consider subscribing. Go ahead and click on the notification bell icon to be notified when new videos drop. Um, you can also support us at Patreon at patreon.com slash ohm audio channel. Um, we'll be providing some exclusive content on uh, Patreon, as well as some other additional perks. You can take a look at that, see if anything interests you, and become a Patreon member would be greatly appreciated. Take a look at the description below. You'll find affiliate links for this speaker, as well as products mentioned in this video. 
and also products that we use during our evaluation period for this uh, speaker as well as some other speakers we have upcoming. And, and speaking of products, we are not done with this yet. We are going to be taking a look, cracking this thing open and see what we can do just to improve it just ever so slightly more for just a little bit more money. Can we make this thing a giant killer? I think it might be a little bit of a fun experiment. It might be a complete failure. Who knows? Let's find out together. Also, if you think this is going to be a great speaker for yourself, uh, particularly for you home theater guys, you're really going to want to stick around for this because they made a center channel. And there's somebody flexing the toilet. <laughs> uh, toilet's almost full. Okay, here we go.